in the midst of a, a long teaching here, and he says at verse 9, After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Now, uh, we started out to look at this a little bit last week. And I was saying that it's not my intention to try to break down this particular prayer instruction and understand it thoroughly, but we're talking about prayer. Prayer is an interesting and a peculiar thing. It's, it's a great privilege and a great challenge all at the same time. It's got quiet. Most of us are aware that it's, it's more of a privilege than we generally treat it like. <laughs> and... Yet there's a great deal about it which is difficult for us to understand. The ways that things work in prayer don't always seem to go along with what our intuition tells us would be the case. It doesn't seem to behave in a way that we consider sensible. And then people take anecdotal experiences from prayer and, and build doctrines out of them. And, and we, get, we hear lots of things. You stick around a while, you if you've been a Christian for more than a few minutes, you've heard some interesting doctrines on the subject of prayer, and they don't all agree with each other, and they're all based on somebody's story of this is, we, we know this works this way because. Has everybody heard that one a time or two? And, and so it, it can get very complicated. And I was saying, you know, I, I didn't want to uh, call this propositions concerning prayer because it was a little bit more of me scratching my head. And I didn't like the term paradoxes concerning prayer because that seemed to put the, the emphasis on the fact that something was wrong with the prayer. Uh, perplexities concerning prayer is a complicated and odd way to say it, but it's guess how I said it, because I'm perplexed sometimes about what about prayer doesn't seem to jibe with my brain's approach to things. And we were going to talk about a few of those things last week. We managed to talk about one because you guys listen slowly. But uh, the one perplexity that we did manage to, to bring up is that even though he knows what I need, I'm supposed to ask. And even though he tells me he knows what I need before I ask, that doesn't exempt me from asking. And to most of us, that's kind of peculiar. If he knows, why do I need to mention it? If he, if he really thoroughly grasps this, why do I need to speak? Why isn't he just taking care of it? And the answer to the why question is, I'm not answering the why questions, because I don't know if I have answers to the why questions. The point is, at some point, we've got to engage with what he's telling us to do, even if we don't have the why. And those of us who have the engineering-style brains that like to know the why and understand the process have a lot of trouble with that sometimes. But there are some things that you just have to do. It's getting quiet. And we certainly know that we're not going to be able to say, well, he knows what I have need of before I ask, therefore I shouldn't bother to ask. That's something which you'll hear in conversation. That's what you'll hear people say. You know, God's got a lot to do. I don't like to bother him with my prayers. You know, the big guy upstairs, he knows what I need. If he wants to send it, he'll just send it on down. It'll be great. And you're, now you're trying to remember if you've said that. I see. But, you know, it, it sounds sensible. It works intellectually, but... It isn't scriptural because we're told over and over again to ask. In fact, in just his closing instructions to his disciples in, in John chapter 15 and 16, uh, Jesus tells us about a half a dozen times that we're to ask. Ask in my name. You shall ask the Father. He's talking asking. And so there is an asking to be done here. We obviously have some need to ask, and there's something kind of humbling about asking. For some reason, we just are not... It seems to be just kind of built into the way the flesh operates. We don't like to ask. Yes. You know, it's not just God. We just don't like to ask. Can't you see I could use your help? Why aren't you offering it? <laughs> Why aren't you asking for it? Well, that would humble me, and I don't want to do that. I just want help. That's all, you know. And, and it's, I see we're totally engaged with that. Okay. But uh, a second point that I want to visit briefly this week, <laughs> we touched on last week in, in Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says, 
at verse 7, ask and it shall be given to you. There's one of those ask, we're supposed to be asking. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And we recognize that the way that this sentence is constructed in English, it seems simple enough, but the way that the grammar works in the Greek, it's actually kind of cut the suggestion of ask and keep asking, seek and keep seeking, knock and keep knocking, and I think perhaps it's the amplified version of the Bible which kind of renders it that way. Uh, But the, the suggestion here is that persistence is necessary. And what's interesting about that is that we have a hard time separating persistence from not being heard. Kids do that. Dad, 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 dad. Why are you talking to me this way? Because you're not paying attention to me is what they're saying, right? Because if, they're, if they're convinced you're listening, they're done saying dad and on to what it was they were saying dad about. But they're going to say dad 57 times in 12 seconds if you're not paying attention. And some people think that's what prayer is about. See, God's busy, he's big, he's really old. And you, you just, you got you to gotta hit him, you got to hit him every day. You got to hit him early and often. You start before the sun's up, you hammer him all day long, and you may get through at some point if you keep it up. And if you don't succeed today, go to bed, get up early, start again tomorrow. You got to hit him early, you got to hit him often. You just keep working him till you break him down and get him to pay attention. And you're all looking at me funny. I mean, nobody's prayer manual actually says it that way, but there are some of them which seem to have basically the storm the castle approach to prayer, right? That if we just hit him hard enough and often enough, eventually this works. And so sometimes in a response to that, we all go, oh, that's, that's terrible. That's, 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 there's no faith in that. Goodness gracious, that's terrible. What we need to do is just ask once and never mention it again. That sounds sensible too, doesn't it? But there's a challenge with that as well, because there are specific instructions concerning persistence in prayer. And that raises that perplexity. Why do I need to be persistent, though I'm heard? If I have confidence that I'm heard, why do I need to be persistent? And the answer is going to be, we're not dealing with the why. We're not answering the why, we're dealing with the why. I need to be persistent. And I'm not being persistent in order to be heard, because just back in chapter 6, just before we started reading, Jesus said that we, when we pray, at verse 7, we, when we pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Now, what he doesn't say in verse 7 is don't ever repeat yourself. What he says is don't repeat yourself with empty repetitions the way the heathen do, thinking they'll be heard for their much speaking. If the reason you're repeating yourself is to try to hammer your way through the heavenlies and pierce the ear of God, you're making a mistake because that's what he said, don't do. That's what the heathen do. The heathen keep shouting at their idols because they think they're not getting through. They keep pestering them because they think they're not getting through. In fact, the, the, the basic, the default setting in the world towards the concept of deity is that God is not interested in me, not paying attention to me, far too big and busy for me, not favorably disposed towards me, and it is my job through prayer and sacrifice and good deeds to woo him to my point of view, to get his attention and his favor. This is what pagan religion is about. This this is what... um, the basic natural state of man re- defaults to this setting. Are you guys still here? Yeah. That, that this is what we want to do. When we approach the God of heaven, he loved me before I loved him. He sacrificed before I sacrificed. He gave before I gave. He made the first move. I don't need to try to get him to be favorably disposed towards me. I don't have to try to work my way around to his good side so that he'll rain on my crops this year or so that the river won't flood my house this year. I don't have to try to to appease his anger or win his favor. That's never what I'm doing in prayer. But I do have to 
repeat myself and show some persistence sometimes, and that, although it is peculiar to me, needs to be done. Did you get that? And let's go look at Luke chapter 18 again while we're at it. Now, last week we were looking at one story. This week we'll, we'll look at the other story. But Luke 18, Jesus teaches two specific stories. He gives examples, analogies here of what he's talking about in prayer. And in each case, he tells us, the, the text tells us what the purpose was in this particular story. That's a great advantage because most of the time the text doesn't tell us what the purpose was. We are left to try to grasp that ourselves by the Spirit. But in this case, he tells us. And we looked at the second one last week, which is the, the two guys going up to pray, right? Let's look at that one first. In verse 9, it says, He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and the publican, standing afar off, would not, so, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So this is a parable Jesus told to folks who are trusting in themselves, believing that their righteousness is sufficient, and despising others and judging others because of that position. And he, he gives them this parable. And the two things that I want to bring out uh, in, in remembrance of that from last week are at the beginning in verse 11, when he says this guy, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. That phrase, with himself, is a peculiar phrase to have in the midst of the prayer, but that's pretty much what it says in the Greek too. It seems to be almost implying that he isn't praying to God, he's praying to himself. He's talking to himself about how righteous he is and hoping maybe God is eavesdropping or something. But his prayer is mostly about him, not that he's the topic of the prayer, he's the recipient of the prayer as well. He's petitioning himself to remember how awesome he is. Are we here? And he, he, I'm going to suggest that however much time you spend in prayer, none of it needs to be spent praying with yourself in that sense. Are you awake? The second thing is that when the, the uh, publican cries out, he says, Lord, be merciful to me. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And specifically, the mercy he's crying out for, the term that we're translating merciful there, is to, to uh, propitiate me, which is a complicated way of saying, fix it. I'm broken, and you need to fix this. Instead of coming saying, I've got it all together and you should be excited about that, he comes saying, I'm broken and I need you to fix it. And that is a critical understanding of how we come in prayer. Now let's look at the, the one that Jesus teaches just before that. He, it begins in verse 1 here, he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So why, why is he teaching this? Because people ought always to pray and not to quit, not to faint, not to give up, not to let go, not to stop. We're talking about persistence, right? And here's his story. He says, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. There was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith. On the earth. Now there's a whole lot here to unpack, but notice what he says about the, the outcome at verse 7. God is, though he bears long, though you pray day and night, and it seems as though he's taken a long time to get it done, when he moves, it will happen speedily, suddenly. Things change rapidly. You're not looking for gradual change in a wearing away. You're looking for a sudden turn. So you shouldn't be discouraged that there doesn't seem to be much progress because you don't make progress on sudden things. 
Many times we, we will persist in something and it will seem as though there's nothing and then all at once things turn. That is often the way these things work and that is specifically what he's addressing here. God will avenge them speedily. But in this parable, God is not an unjust judge. Let me say that again. God is not an unjust judge. He doesn't have no respect for law. He doesn't have no respect for righteousness. He doesn't have no respect for what's right. So this is obviously a very imperfect analogy, not intended to be turned into some sort of exotic doctrinal statement. But even in this case, he says, an unjust judge who can be pressured by repeated prayer is an example of how persistence has value we need to understand that though God isn't going to say, oh, they're going to weary me if they keep coming. They're just coming at me and coming at me and coming at me. If I keep sending them away, they're just going to keep coming. Eventually, they're just going to give me a black eye over this thing. I need to just shut this down. I guess I'll give them what they want. Does anybody actually think that's the way that God operates? I wouldn't imagine that anybody here is going to say, well, as a matter of fact, that's pretty much the picture I operate with. Yeah, that's it right there. I, I would imagine that most of us are going to say, no, that doesn't sound a lot like God to us. That's what the unjust judge is behaving like. But that isn't going to be why God's going to do this. That isn't going to be how God's going to do this. But the picture of the widow's persistence is the picture of what we need to be in prayer. He taught this so that people would pray all the time and not quit. And he said, if, if this woman, just by persistence, can break down a thoughtless, careless, selfish, inconsiderate judge who has no interest in what's right or true and no concern for her at all, if she can eventually get what she wants by persistence, how much more would it be true when God already wants to avenge the just? and wants to turn things, and wants to do things, how much more should we show persistence? She's going back to deal with a judge who has given her no reason to believe this is going to work. We're coming to the throne of grace where we've been given every reason to believe this is going to work. Why shouldn't we keep coming? Is that saying something to us? Persistence. The first perplexity we were dealing with is that we need to mention things though he knows them. The second one is that we need to be persistent though he hears us. And the third one, come on with me to Matthew chapter 9 for a moment. And I want to visit this here. Now back in chapter 6, you go ahead to chapter 9 because that's where we want to be. But I'm going to read to you again the prayer we started with in chapter 6 and point something out here. This is the, the, the pattern that Jesus brings forward. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Is there anything in this prayer that God doesn't already want to do before you would say that? And the answer is no. This is already all in his will. This is already all on his agenda. This is all stuff he has committed himself to, and yet we're told to ask for it. And that is something, a perplexity for those of us who think about these things. Why do I need to ask for what he already wills? Why do I need to mention what he already knows? Why do I need to persist though he already hears? And why do I need to petition when he already wills? And if you get yourself upset about that, you'll quit petitioning. But even though it's his will, he's asked us to petition. There's something there. I've heard a lot of very interesting speculation on why and the how to the why his asking. I don't know that I have a definitive answer, but I do know this. We're told to ask, even though we know it's his will. Even though there isn't any question that he wants to. And one of the places where that crops up is in the area of what is sometimes called praying for souls or harvest prayer. Because you think, God already wants to save my neighbor. Why should I pray and ask him to? He sent Jesus to die for him. He shed Jesus' blood for him. 
He already, what, what is the point of saying, Lord, save Mike, save Mike next door? What is the point of that kind of prayer? And then you hear these great testimonies of how well that sort of thing works and the great results that have come from it. And you think, but that doesn't make any sense to me. That, why would that make sense? Why would that work? That seems so peculiar. Then you'll hear somebody say, as I did again recently, you know, I don't know that I know a single person that I can honestly say I'm convinced as a Christian who can't point to somebody that they say was praying for them now that they consider it and think about it and look back on it. I thought, well, that may or may not be the case with me. I'm not sure. But it's an interesting thing to have said. It's not exactly the sort of thing you're going to build a doctrine out of because there's no chapter and verse to that, but it doesn't seem like it should work that way. Anybody besides me have trouble with things that don't seem like they should work that way? But the point is, it's got to be done just the same. And here at the end of Matthew chapter 9, we run into this amazing story. It, it says in verse 36, but when he, that's Jesus, Jesus, verse 35, Jesus is going about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then he saith, or then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now that is such a peculiarity, because is there any possibility that the Lord of the harvest isn't interested in the harvest? Doesn't care about the harvest unless we ask? Isn't paying any attention to the harvest? We, we know that this is God's will and he's on top of this thing, right? Yes. And yet, here's Jesus in the red ink telling us to pray and ask him to send laborers. And it's like, wh why does it work that way? I don't know why it works that way. I don't even want to know why it works that way. I just know this. We have a calling to do what this stuff says we need to do. And we need to do it. Jesus looks at the crowds and he sees them. He sees them, in the, in the King James, it says, they fainted and were scattered abroad. The New American Standard, going for the alliteration, says they were distressed and downcast. The New Century Version, also competing in alliteration, says they were hurting and helpless. People, people who are suffering, people who are not doing well, people who are running to and fro and acting like they have no direction and no plan and no understanding of what's going on. Jesus sees that and it, it pains him, it bothers him. He's moved with compassion on them. This is not what they were created for. This is not what the God of heaven's will for them is. This is not what's supposed to be happening here. What I'm seeing is not creation exactly as it ought to be. But it's, it's people running around as though they have no direction, no purpose, no Lord looking after them. And he makes a statement, the harvest truly is plenteous but the laborers are few. There's plenty of harvest out there. Plenty of harvest. But the laborers, there's not so very many. But his response is to say, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. The Lord, one translation says, who owns the harvest. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. When you see that the harvest is plenteous and the laborers are few, instead of getting discouraged and crying, instead of deciding that it's too big of a task, instead of getting angry with everybody who isn't doing what you think they ought to be doing, he says, pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest. Prayer requires humility. And sometimes it's hard to be humble when we're being angry or self-righteous or any of the other things which try to beset us. Anybody besides me ever struggled with anger or self-righteousness? It's difficult to pray from a position of anger and self-righteousness. But what he says to do is pray. What he says to do is pray. And he says, pray the Lord of the harvest. And he uses a peculiar word for prayer, a word which is not one of our most frequent words describing prayer. And it, it's, it's a lot of times uh, translations like the word beseech, uh, which is kind of a $2 way of, of asking. But it's, it's, the word has a peculiar kind of uh, connotation to it. 
W.E. Vine says it means to desire, to long for, usually representing the word need, sometimes translated beseech. Strong says the word means to beg, comes from a, a word for binding, as binding oneself. And Barry in his New, Text, uh, New Testament lexicon says it means to have need of or to make request of. We're, we're talking about needing from the Lord. Not just saying to the Lord, but needing from the Lord of the harvest that he send laborers into the harvest. We're talking about a, a different attitude in prayer. We're not talking about a casual, lightweight kind of prayer. Lord bless Timmy and Michael and uh, yeah, make that, make that meeting I got at 10 o'clock work out well. And uh, Oh yeah, send laborers into the harvest. That would be great. We do that every day because we're supposed to. In Jesus' name, amen. You know that prayer? Nobody wants to admit they know that prayer. Oh, okay. But uh, that's not the prayer that Jesus is asking for here. He didn't say, mention in your prayers to the Lord of the harvest that we'd like some laborers. He's talking about need from the Lord of the harvest, laborers into the harvest. Need them from him. Ask the way a beggar asks. Now, we don't, we don't encounter beggars on a routine basis around here like you do in much of the world, but I, I've traveled some of the world, and, and people don't just sit around with a cup or a basket saying, surely you notice me, and if you wanted to do something, you would, and I don't need to be doing anything to get your attention. Any of you globetrotters? That's not the way it works in the rest of the world, right? Somebody with a need latches eyes onto you and thinks you may be an answer, they're going to let you know. They're going to let you know from across the street and down the block that you are the answer that they are looking for, right? If they're mobile, they're coming to you if you don't look like you're coming to them. Hello? They need something from you, and they want you to know they need it. They're not just asking, they're needing. And if they possibly can, they're going to convince you to give them what they're asking for, not later, not after you've thought about it, not after you've talked to your wife about it, right now, right here, please. Please, 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 I mean please, I really mean it, please, please. And one of the hardest things that you do is, is recognize I cannot meet all of, all of your needs. And there are some of you that I'm not going to be able to do something for. I still, just as I started telling the story, I flashed back to the, the first time I was really accosted that way. I mean, I've been encountered a few times, but I mean a guy who was clearly living a desperate life in a desperate way. And it, it does something to you when you meet people who are as sheep without a shepherd and realize it, it, it changes things in you when you in, encounter that. But that's the attitude that he's describing us taking. He didn't say have a casual interest in the harvest. He's talking about need something from the Lord of the harvest. Need something enough to plead for it. Need something enough to ask for it with persistence need something enough to go after it. And it's a very interesting thing because then he goes on and he says that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And when we're talking about sending forth, the word is literally, it's the word, the Greek word for throw with the prefix on it, which means out. And we're asking him to throw out some laborers into the harvest. Cast them out. The word is not usually associated with sending forth. It's associated with tossing stuff, casting out. And it's that kind of picture. We're, we're not asking him to release to us a few laborers. We're asking him to dump over the basket and throw out some laborers. Make it needful for them to go. The picture here is a person whose prayer for the harvest is so engaged and so passionate that they need the Lord of the harvest to send some laborers. And the Lord of the harvest is so engaged that he's not just saying, well, you could go if you'd like. Remember Margaret? You might want to talk to Margaret. You, sir, would you like to be a laborer in the harvest? But he's throwing them out into the harvest. He's making it needful for them. They're finding themselves in the harvest laboring without even understanding what's happened to them. 
Are you awake? The calling on them is so strong, the passion in them is so consuming that they are being cast into the harvest to labor. Now, we can all go and casually labor in the harvest. I would venture to say there isn't a single person here who hasn't casually labored in the harvest. But it's another thing altogether when the Lord of the harvest throws you into the harvest. Something happens when that goes on. And the picture that we're getting from Jesus here is that when people see need and need something from the Lord of the harvest, and he connects and throws laborers into the harvest, something exciting happens. Something exciting happens. And the people that God's been bringing across my heart, the names and the faces which come to me, are harvest. Harvest that he cares passionately about, that he wants me to care passionately about. And whether I be the laborer or whether I just plead until a laborer goes, either way, there needs to be a passion for this harvest which is birthed in us. Is this making some sense to you? Now let me... Uh, let me revisit this in, in the amplified version of the Bible which is going to underscore a little bit of what I'm saying here. And let me, uh, let me be back up to verse 36 again. Have I got it cooking here? Not quite yet. There we go. When he saw the throngs, he was moved with pity and sympathy for them because they were bewildered, harassed and distressed and dejected and helpless. Does anybody see people like that? It isn't always my experience that I look out the window and say, those people look like sheep without a shepherd. That is not an image which comes to me all that often. But I look out the window and I see people who look bewildered, harassed, distressed, dejected, and helpless every day of my life. I don't know where you could go that you wouldn't encounter that. Certainly, you know, the population centers, we see that, Main Street and Willimantic, Stores Center, campus of ECSU, campus of UConn. You don't have to walk very far to encounter these people, but even, even out in the woods and the cow pastures, every here and there as you're driving along and you see two houses in a mile and a half, you see people and what you see looks a lot like bewildered and harassed and distressed and dejected and helpless, doesn't it? They got nice stuff, they take care of their lawn. But I see a lot of bewildered. I see a lot of dejected. Not every single person always strikes me that way, but an awful lot of them, I see what Jesus saw when he looked at this crowd. And I'm guessing that you've got the Spirit of God in you, you're seeing some of the same stuff I'm seeing. And you're seeing it some of the same ways I see it. And that this isn't just a, an exciting and melodramatic way of presenting it, but that this is pretty much what we see. Bewildered, harassed, distressed, dejected, helpless people, like sheep without a shepherd. Now let's look at verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is indeed plentiful, but the laborers are few. And So pray to the Lord of the harvest to force out and thrust laborers into his harvest. That was the wording I was looking for. I don't know if that does anything for you. I like that. To force out and thrust laborers into his harvest. Sometimes I'm that laborer who needs to be forced out and thrust. I see I'm the only one in this group, but uh, sometimes I'm that guy who's just way too comfortable in his living room, who's far more comfortable over here on this side of the room than on that side of the room talking to that person. I actually, the, the other day, I saw somebody I knew in a public place, somebody, I, not somebody I knew well, somebody I had met in a public place, somebody I had been praying for specifically in the harvest prayer kind of sense. I saw them and I thought, this is not a good time for me. I know you don't think selfish and foolish thoughts like that, but that's what I thought. I thought, this is not a good time for me. And they have not seen me. So I can just complete my business here and disappear, and this will be fine. We can do this some other time. You guys are 
getting ready to pick up stones, I can tell as I'm speaking here. But I'm, I'm actually on my way out, and I'm coming under conviction that something needs to change. It's not talk to him the next time you see him, do better next time. It's like, this time isn't over, John. You can still fix this. You need to go back. Now, uh, this story would be cooler if it ended with, you know, the two of us having an all-afternoon prayer meeting or something, which it doesn't. But the point is, you go back, you say, hey, remember me? My name is John. How you doing? Why are you going to do something like that? Because once in a while, God makes it so uncomfortable for you to stay where you are, doing what you're doing, that no matter how much you didn't want to do that, it looks better than what you're experiencing right now. <laughs> Hello? I don't know if that's your experience. It's my experience a lot. There's a lot of things the Lord asked me to do, and I think, I'll get to that when I'm ready, sir. That's a great plan. I'll go over there and handle that. But right now, I've got this, and then this becomes so intolerable that I've got to go do that. He's great at forcing out and thrusting laborers into the harvest. But he's asked us to join him in that by praying. And when we pray, and when we have that passionate prayer where we need from the Lord of the harvest laborers into this harvest, where we, we make a demand and cry out for laborers into this harvest, when we do that, he not only sends laborers into the harvest, but he frequently, in my experience, will force out and throw me into the harvest as the very laborer I was praying for. And not always to the specific aspect of the harvest I was praying about, but one of the beautiful things about this is that as I become the answer to someone else's prayer, somebody becomes the answer to my prayer. Maybe I'm not the one who's able to present the good news to my cousins in a way that they see it, but I'm presenting the good news to somebody's cousins that they're praying for. And then somebody is encountering my cousins. Is this connecting? I don't know why we're supposed to mention things though he knows them. I don't know why we're supposed to persist though he hears. And I don't know why we're supposed to petition though he wills. But I do know this. I'm going to. I mention things he knows. I persist in things he's heard. And I will petition for things that are his will. Because that's what I've been commanded to do. And that's what obedience and humility demands of me. Yes. Amen? Yes. As I mentioned earlier, we've got a chance to pray tonight. But whether you choose to join us and pray tonight or whether you just to cho choose to join in prayer, I would like to suggest that the Spirit of God is calling for a fresh start in harvest prayer an intentional start in harvest prayer. People who are receiving the kindled passion of the Spirit to need from God some kind of action on this harvest, to cry out for it, and to see him, whoops, I've lost my, what is it? Thrust out and what? No, force out and thrust. There we go. Force out and thrust laborers into the harvest. Sounds to me like the laborers don't have to get the, don't have to be the ones that came up with this plan. The willing and obedient eat the good of the land, but sometimes the unwilling go anyway. <laughs> and and it, it, I don't know, does that excite you? Yeah. It excites me some. Let's stand up together, if you will. I want to take a moment and read to you from the 10th chapter of the book of Romans. Where it says to us at the ninth verse that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I want to take just a moment. I'm going to, I'm going to pray and acknowledge that I believe in my heart and that I confess and, and submit my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to, you can join me in that. If you've never done that, this is a critical step, and it's, you say, I don't know if the Holy Spirit's leading me to or not. That peculiar, nagging sense that you need to do something is probably the Holy Spirit leading you to. 
I often get asked, I'm not sure what I believe in my heart. I'm not even sure what I mean by believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Where we hear the word of God, we begin to believe. We're offered an opportunity to believe, but believing usually demands some kind of step of us. And we have to take hold of, if you will, take ownership of that believing. I believe that, that the opportunity to believe is extended, but we've got to take some action on that and do something about it. If you're feeling that, sometimes we use the term pricked in our hearts, but sometimes people don't even know what we mean by pricked in our hearts, but that, that peculiar agitated sense that I need to do something, but I don't know what, I think this is the something. We need to acknowledge that we believe in our hearts that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord so that we can receive this astonishing gift from the God who made us and loves us and has redeemed us. I'm going to take a moment and pray that way, and if you'd like to join me, you may. Dear God, I thank you in Jesus' name for hearing my cry today. I do believe in my heart you've raised Jesus from the dead. And I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, Father, for this new life and your spirit with me to give me strength, wisdom, direction in Jesus' name. Amen.